what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in Jesus were later to receive. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ the Word. may be seated. Uh, before I get into the Word this morning, um, at the 8.30 service, um, I was uh, uh, chastised a little bit, I have to be honest, um, about the way in which my stall keeps moving. And so, um, I'm just going to get this all out of the way right at the very moment. If I'm preaching, because I use my hands a lot, and suddenly it does this, <laughs> don't worry. If I'm preaching and it suddenly goes like this, don't worry, I'll kind of feel it. Um, and every now and again, I might just do this, you know, just to uh, figure this out. Um, I, I, was, I was told that uh, several of the, uh, the Elmos who are all uh, you know, type A personalities uh, were begging to stand up during the beginning of my sermon and try to straighten things out. I've told them other people have tried to straighten me out in the past. It has not worked, um, uh, but uh, those of you who are observant will see in our display that there is this beautiful whip up here, and uh, I've been threatened with that this morning. So anyway, <laughs> so I might just do this just for fun. Anyway, let's pray together. <laughs> Preacher needs some prayer this morning. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we are thank you and thankful for humor. We're grateful for your presence. We're grateful for the ways in which you live and breathe and have your being among us. We're grateful, God, that you are a God that's still speaking and who invites us in this season of Lent to open our hearts and our minds to the transforming witness of a Holy Spirit. So engage with us now, God, as we engage with each other, as we engage in this experience of worship, that in this engagement with your Spirit, we might hear your voice, lean more fully into your presence, and live more dynamically in the world. And now, God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So for those of you who were present with us on Ash Wednesday, you will know that we have begun the season of Lent. See, the season of Lent means different things to different people, and each and every one of us engage in it at a different level. This year, we're inviting you to engage in a new way, to find a way for yourself. And in these next 40 days and 40 nights, this journey to Easter and beyond, uh, engaging with each other through our small groups, through our book study, uh, through worship, to take this opportunity of Lent to come to that season of Easter, perhaps transformed, perhaps changed, not to just go through the motions of Lent um, and all that that necessarily offers to us liturgically, but to think about the way that we are in being invited to different, to something new, to something more transformative, to perhaps even go deeper than any Lent that we have been before, to find a way that is beyond the ordinary, if you will, and to use our book and our studies uh, to use this season of Lent to prepare us, heart, mind, body, and spirit, not just for Easter and resurrection, but for the other wonderful moments of the Christian calendar Pentecost and all the way through to Christmas all over again. 
It's so easy for us just to go through the motions of the liturgical calendar without understanding perhaps the implications of the journey that we have been journeying together on. And this year we invite you, we sincerely invite you, uh, to find the way of Jesus, to find the way of the gospel, to find the way that has deeper meaning for us in our lives and implications, I believe, than for the ways in which we live and have our being. Ash Wednesday, an opportunity for us to remember that from dust we came and to dust we shall return, that each and every one of us is mortal, and that each and every one of us will ultimately die knowing our mortality. And what it is that we did in the in-between time is more important than perhaps the dates of our birth or the dates of our passing. How we live our lives has great implications for the ways of the world. And as followers of Jesus, we believe that we live our way in the way of Jesus, in the way of truth, of light, of love, of grace, of mercy, of compassion, all of the values that we say we see recognized in the life and body of Jesus. The prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament gives us some indications of what that means for those of us who follow in the way. And the prophet Isaiah would invite those individuals to find a new way, to find another way of living. Not the ways of the world, but the ways of God. I love this scripture reading that invites us to come buy of milk and wine with no money. I, I don't know about you, but I would love to walk into any shop and say, I have no money, but I want some milk and some wine. Mine will be a Melbeck. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Come without money, without price, and come and buy. Come and buy so that all of us might be filled to overflowing and to know the abundance of this God that we worship. Come and buy. Those of you who have nothing, those of you who have much, come and buy. The invitation is not really about milk and wine, although I would much prefer it to be. But the invitation is to go beyond what the world offers us, to go beyond the economies of the world, to go beyond the ways in which we have judged everything by status or status, to go beyond the ways in which we so often judge one another, to go beyond the ways in which we see the economy of our world to the economy that is based in God. An economy that was created right at the very beginning of creation when God created it all and said, come, taste and see that God is good. Come without money, without price. Come without the ways of the world, the distractions of the world, the ways in which the world often judges. You see, Christianity, as I've said on many occasions from this chancel, is not so much a religion as it is a lifestyle choice. It is something that we must put on. And I say that because the ways of the world is not always the ways of Jesus. The ways of the world are based on a very different economy. The ways of the world is based on an economy where somehow we have to put others down in order to feel as if we are superior. The ways of the world are often designated by how much income we have, or our class, or our gender, or our gender identity. The ways of the world often judges rather than replenishes. And the ways of the world, often colluded by the church of Jesus Christ, let's be frank and honest, isn't that why Jesus came as that countercultural experience of the world to reinforce God's economy? Not the economy of judgment and hatred and violence, but an economy based of grace and truth and love. That so often, even within our churches, and we cannot deny the history of the Christian church that has also been violent, has also produced judgment, is very quick to judge rather than to forgive. That Jesus invites us into a way other than our own, a way other than the world and to replenish our spirits so that we can come and buy without money and without price. Because what God is offering us is something that the world cannot. And yet if we're truthful, we find ourselves living by the ways of the world rather than by the ways of God more often than not. It's not to judge us, it's not to make us feel guilty, it's not to make us feel as if somehow we're not good people. 
but just to understand that we live in the world. And Jesus would say to us, you may be in the world, but you are not of the world. That our experience as people of faith is to be those countercultural experiences, those countercultural peoples, those people of faith that will stand for something that will rise up with our voices of hope and liberation, that will rise up so that the ways of God may be the economy of the world, an economy where all people are welcome, an economy that whether you've got money or not, you still have access to all of the provisions and the needs that are provided by the ways in which the world should live. And that you and I, as people of faith, must stand in those gaps in the countercultural experience time after time. And that means that we have to be in places. We have to be in communities. We have to be in small groups. We have to be in these places where we can re engage with the way of Jesus rather than the ways of the world. That you and I must stand above the parapet sometimes that you and I must make these next 40 days and 40 nights count for something, perhaps to replenish our spirit, perhaps to take beyond this experience something that might give us hope and liberation beyond Easter and beyond the experience of resurrection. Perhaps what God is inviting us into in this season of Lent is to take that inward inventory of the places where we need some adjustment, some realignment, if you will, with the ways of Jesus rather than the ways in which many of us continue to live. And that means that you and I are called to invest ourselves, that you and I must count ourselves as worthy of that investment, and that you and I together might begin to change the way so that the world might become different. It might become more like Jesus, perhaps. Or it might have people of good conscience who are trying their hardest to be good people. And sometimes that even means that we need to realign ourselves and our theology even counter to what the church may be saying. We're not unfamiliar with that at Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ. Many of us have realigned our theology with a theology of hope and liberation rather than a a theology of judgment and hatred. Many of us have begun that journey of trying to reconcile ourselves to the faith of our childhood, perhaps, to the faith that we now experience and hold on to. Many of us in this place have come to a fuller understanding of God's love for all people. And how many of us, perhaps, have theologies gone past where we were told that some people were less equal than others? We have found our way through because we have realigned ourselves with the way that is other than the world, and sometimes even a theology that is other than the church. I was mindful as I've been reading this past week a couple of really good books, of course, our Lenten book study, but another book that helps me in this season of Lent to come to concern and also to realization of why I still call myself a Christian When, quite frankly, there are many reasons why, in the way in which Christianity is portrayed in the world today, there's every good reason why so many people are leaving the church. As I've been reconciling myself, understanding that so much of our theology comes from a white dominance and from an empire that is more concerned with replicating harm and damage than it is about offering liberation and hope. And how we, as people of faith, remain faithful to a way other than our own, a way other than white nationalism or or white Christianity or American Christianity or Western Christianity, but to move beyond just those limitations to a God that is so big and so expansive and so majestic and so loving and so kind and so gracious that God is calling you and I to be those very vessels in the world today. That's... That's what the gospel is about. Come without money and without price. Come without having to fit some kind of label or some kind of theological understanding. But to come just as you are, wherever you are on life's journey, come without money and price and know that the table is open and welcome to you. And then let the Holy Spirit do everything else. 
You know, the preacher's job is not to convince you that God is real. I think that's right. (laughs) The preacher's job is to awaken something within us to the possibility and to the potential that you are good and that God's Spirit remains and lives within each and every one of us, and then we allow the Holy Spirit to do the job that the Holy Spirit does. It awakens us to the great potential and the great possibilities of what Isaiah would say and that Jesus would echo in John's gospel. Come, not for the way of the world, not the way the world would want to sell you out, but come to the way of God. The way of God that is not about money and price. The way of God that is about gifts that the world can't offer us. The world can't offer us compassion and kindness and greatness because that's not the way the world is today. But we can. We can stand against that dominant culture. We can stand a way other than our own and find an alternative way. An alternative way that stretches us, an alternative way that moves us, an alternative way that perhaps even feels at at first unusual, queer perhaps, but a way of Jesus, a way that forgives easily, shows compassion kindly, that actually cares when we're in church together and when we are not in church together, a way that has the best interests of others before our own, and we will lift up the brokenhearted, and we'll lift up those that have been downtrodden, that will reconcile people to this grace of God. Lent serves us at least two purposes for several people. The first is an opportunity to step outside of the world and to have some intentional time of knowing who God is in our lives. And it has also been used specifically within the Roman Catholic Church to find those who are backslidden, who perhaps left the church for a while, as a stepping stone back into the church, preparing themselves for Easter and for resurrection. It is a unique opportunity for you and for me in this congregation this morning to take time for ourselves, to invest, to count ourselves worthy of God's goodness, and then to live that in our everyday lives, even when it stretches us, even when it feels a little unusual, because we've been sold the ways of the world even in our churches, rather than the ways of God. God's economy is not about empire. God's economy is about sharing and inclusion. It's about knowing that every single one of us counts. It's about knowing that each and every one of us is worthy. But that does not mean that we place ourselves in hierarchy to one another. It flattens the table to the place where we're all welcome. And perhaps even in today's culture, it doesn't just flatten the table, but it makes some dips in it so that those who are vertically challenged or disabled still have access to the table. Can I get an amen this morning? It ensures that no one is left behind, and it ensures that you and I are those countercultural experiences of a way other than our own. Because so often, if it was my way, or your way, and don't worry, I'm not going to sing Frank Sinatra's song this morning, (laughs) but if it was my way or the world's way, it would be about someone on top and someone not. God's economy includes us all. Come without money and price. Come, buy food and wine. Come, buy what the world cannot offer you. And that is something that is priceless. It is the invitation of this God of grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and compassion that goes the extra mile every single time. And then invites us to be like Jesus. 
to take those extra steps, to take those extra bold moves, to live a way other than the world, and to seek out God's economy, to seek out God's way. I do sing my way at karaoke, it is my song. <laughs> and at the very end of that song, there is a reprise of the last line, I did it my way. At every karaoke that I have sung in the last decade or so of that one song, because it's the only one I know, I always sing, I did it God's way. And I pray that I will live into that as long as I possibly can because I believe that Christianity is worth saving. And sometimes it has to be saved from people who call themselves Christian. May we be bold enough in this season of Lent to live in God's economy, to find ways in which we might stretch ourselves in this radical movement of inclusion, and to live more graciously and lovingly with one another, not based on status or based on money or economy, but based on knowing that we are all one in Christ Jesus, that we are siblings in Christ, and that we might find another way. We'll call it God's way today, so that we all might know that we are welcome. Happy Lent, everybody. Lent is not about sackcloth and ashes as much as I love to wear my little black dress on these Sundays. It's about hope and liberation. It's about preparing ourselves for the great celebration of Easter and the celebration beyond Easter to the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes all of this possible. May we prepare our hearts and minds in the next 40 days and 40 nights, and may we find not only our lives better and different because of it, but because of what we have invested, we might find the world is a better place. Amen. God bless you, Cathedral of Hope. to God's gracious mercy and protection each and every one of us is given. And the blessing of God known to us as Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us. Enable us, God, as we go back out into the world to use these days to be vessels of hope and compassion 
of peace and forgiveness, finding a way other than our own so that ultimately God 